Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Uh, welcome to episode uh, 55, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of May 3rd through 9th, 2012. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next, oh, almost half hour, uh, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. As always, any comments, questions, reactions, tidbits, suggestions, ideas, brickbats, whatever, uh, can be addressed to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which you likely didn't, uh, you can check out my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, which will be up here somewhere a couple of times during the show. And uh, you get the email address from there. I do answer my email. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. Um, I do request, though, that if you do send me an email, uh, I would appreciate it if you include something like your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. Okay, so... Uh, with that in mind, we're going to move on. Uh, I've got a uh, number of things to cover today. Uh, first, I'm going to start with some good news. I love starting with good news. Yes, I love this. Um, I've mentioned uh, before about uh, some states have had these, uh, these so-called personhood bills. These are uh, pieces of legislation that uh, look to ban abortion by saying that the fetus has uh, full legal rights of an actual person from the moment of fertilization, which basically means not only fetus, an embryo, a zygote, has full legal rights. Um, and of course, these are, again, these are meant to ban abortion. In fact, some of them do not even contain an exception for the protection of the health and life of the pregnant woman. Well, there was such a bill, a personhood bill, in the Oklahoma legislature, which everybody expect to pass. It had already passed the state Senate. It had passed a House committee in the state legislature. The governor said she would sign it. And in fact, this same legislature had passed over 30 anti-abortion bills since the right-wingers gained control of the state legislature in 2004. Um, but some grassroots opposition to the bill sprang up, and it became strong enough that some of the Republican legislators in the House were um, proposing amendments to limit the reach of the bill and to clarify some, some aspects of it. And this actually drove a wedge between these right-wingers and the real right-wingers who were uh, behind the bill. They opposed any amendments to the bill at all even ones designed to protect uh, in vitro fertilization, to make sure that birth control is available, or to allow that uh, a woman who was having a life-threatening pregnancy could still get medical treatment. The result of this wedge uh, was that bad blood uh, developed between the legislators and these outside groups, with the result that ultimately the, uh, the bill wasn't brought up at all. And the time limit has now passed. It's too late to bring it up. And so it is dead for this session of the legislature. And that's good news. You might consider that good news 1A. Good news 1B is, oh, by the way, before I leave that, though, uh, the um, Archbishop of Oklahoma City, the Right Reverend Paul Coakley, uh, sent a letter to all the parishes telling all the priests to tell their parishioners to contact their state legislatures and urge them to support this bill. Now, how urging your parishioners to take a specific stance on a specific piece of legislation does not violate their tax-exempt status is something I just, I just don't understand. But in any event... There was also, in Oklahoma, a personhood amendment. This was a ballot question that was supposed to be on the ballot in, in, in November. Uh, this was an amendment to the state constitution that, again, would declare personhood on any zygote. Um, well, the uh, state Supreme Court in Oklahoma just struck that down. They said the ballot question is blatantly, what, did they, what was the specific word they used, was clearly unconstitutional and that therefore it was invalid, could not stand. The court cited the controlling uh, Supreme Court of the United States 
uh, decision, which was Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992. That decision said that states could impose restrictions on abortion, but they could not ban it outright. The court said that, um, the Oklahoma court said that that ruling is as binding on us today as it was 20 years ago, and that this ballot question clearly violates uh, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, um, and so was struck off the ballot. And you might call that good news 1B. Um, the group behind the amendment is an alpha called Personhood USA. They said they're going to appeal this to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in I found this amusing that in trying to justify their argument that the Oklahoma State Supreme Court had gotten it wrong, they cited the minority opinion, the losing side in Planned Parenthood v. Casey as support. All right, there's something else now. There's something else. Uh, there is something called the guinea worm. This is good news number two. There's something called the guinea worm. This is a, a little worm, a little parasite that's been known since Old Testament times. In fact, in numbers, it was referred to and described as the fiery serpent. It's, um, so it's been known for like 3,500 years. And people in Africa still suffer from this. They, uh, get, in, they get infected by unknowingly ingesting inf uh, infested water where the worm has laid its eggs. Um, in the body... Uh, the, the symptoms appear about a year later because in the body, this worm grows to be like three feet long. It burrows through the subcutaneous tissues and eventually emerges out of uh, an enlarged blister, a swollen blister, usually somewhere on the lower leg. The pain is described as, as if the area is on fire, thus the fiery serpent. Um, the pain is debilitating. It, uh, it's so bad that people can't work, which means that for months, people for months suffered with this. And, and by the way, once it starts to come out, the way you remove this worm, it's a little gross, but what you do is you start to catch the worm around a stick and you wind it around the stick and very, very slowly pull this worm out. When I say slowly, I mean slowly. This could take weeks to do. Um, in the 1950s, the Guinea worm infected about 50 million people in Africa. Um, people suffered through months of pain such that they could not tend their crops, they could not take care of their cattle. Well, in 1986, the, uh, the, Carver, uh, the Carter Center, found by, yes, by Jimmy Carter, began a campaign to end this affliction doing it by education about the worm and about its effects and what it is, and by improving the availability of water filtration. Simple filters can help with this. At that time, in 1986, the number of affected people was about 3.5 million. By 2000, it was down to 3,200. By 2010, it was fewer than 1,700. By 2011, it was fewer than 1,700. The Carter Center has helped to eliminate this, this the, the guinea worm uh, infection, which I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly. The technical term is uh, drachenculiasis. Drachenculiasis. There we go. Drachenculiasis. Um, they've helped eliminate this from over 20 nations. Um, and they are now predicting that this is soon going to join smallpox as a disease that has been eradicated from the human population. Now, that's a little bit esoteric. I, it's not brand new. I just happened to come across it this past week, and I just thought that is really just feel-good news that, uh, that people deserve to know about. All right, moving on from there to something else that's actually kind of good news. Occupy. Haven't talked about Occupy for a while, but it rather aggressively reemerged on May 1st with demonstrations in 115 places around the United States. The turnouts at these demonstrations, they range from the dozens in some places to the hundreds and others to thousands and others to tens of thousands in some places. This, in fact, was the scene in New York City as an estimated 20,000 people made their way down Fifth Avenue. Um, now, in the course of these hundreds of protests involving tens of thousands of people, there were, of course, some incidents, not surprisingly. 
And in that old dishonorable media tradition of if it bleeds, it leads, much, in fact, much too much, was made out of these handful of incidents. In fact, too much of the news coverage focused on these small number of incidents from a small number of people to the exclusion of, of other facets. Um, in fact, it's almost like, even despite that tradition, it's almost like there is an intent on the part of the media to discredit Occupy by focusing all of its attention on this totally non-representative handful of people. For example, Seattle. In Seattle. Much was made out of the fact that some black-clad demonstrators uh, broke away from the march and went around breaking some windows. But only one major media outlet, of which I'm aware, and that was the San Francisco Chronicle, only one outfit actually made mention of the fact that there were only about a half a dozen people who were actually trying to break any windows. Um, other places said, well, there were as many as three dozen, but they seem to have counted anybody dressed in black who happened to be there rather than the number of people who were actually trying to do something. And while the media was busily watching this handful of, of nihilists breaking, or in some cases just trying to break windows, there was a peaceful rally going on just a few blocks away, which they didn't cover because it was peaceful. In fact, the local paper, the Seattle Post Intelligencer, devoted all of its coverage to the, uh, to, to the vandalism. And some of, this, some of the media didn't even stop at the protests themselves. ABC News, this is before the events of the day really got started, they couldn't even be bothered to report on what the plans were for the day before they br breathlessly rushed ahead to talk about some um, suspicious white powder, which turned out to be cornstarch, that was sent to seven locations in New York City, most of them Wells Fargo branch, uh, bank branches. Police in New York City were quick to suggest a connection to Occupy, a contention amplified by Reuters, which headlined its article, quoting, more white powder incidents in New York, police see Occupy link. Now, first here, you have to remember, this is the New York City police. This is the outfit that will stop and frisk black people because they're all suspected criminals, of course. Um, says it can search your belongings before you get on the subway just because they can and has said it, it will spy basically on any Muslim within a couple of hundred mile radius because all Muslims are, of course, suspected terrorists. So first off, you have to consider the source. But also, you know, what does it mean to say a link to Occupy? What does that even mean? The Occupy movement has no central structure. There's no central office. There's no membership list. There's no dues you pay. What does it mean to say a link to Occupy? Suppose... Suppose you read about someone who defaced a Romney for president bumper sticker, okay? How would you feel about a headline in that article that said, police see link to Obama re-election campaign? By the way, speaking of New York, the New York Times did its part as, uh, as for the armies of the empire. Its article on the protest were, was headlined, again, I'm quoting, at May Day demonstrations, traffic jams, and arrests. That was the headline. The first three graphs of the article were all about arrests. They couldn't even get around to mentioning what the protests were, were supposed to be about until the fifth graph of the article. Which brings up another thing that really gripes me about all this. Um, we keep hearing the media saying, what are they about? What are they for? You know, what are they trying to do? There's a lack of focus, no clear message. Well, in articles about the May 1st action, these are quotes, okay? MSNBC said people turned out, quote, to rally against austerity measures and call for higher wages and more jobs. In that same article, MSNBC also said that uh, there have been protests during the spring about uh, student debt and worker rights. The San Francisco Chronicle said, quote, Occupy groups across the U.S. have protested economic disparity and high foreclosure and unemployment rates that hurt average Americans, while bankers and financial executives receive bonuses and taxpayer-funded bailouts. 
The New York Times, when it got around to talking about the demonstrations, actually said, quoting, the themes on May Day were the ones that Occupy Wall Street has sounded from the outset of the movement last fall. Opposition to big banks and the government that bailed them out after they helped cause the recession. Now, there's a clear theme running through all of that, which can be summed up with the issues are economic injustice and corruption of a political system. The same, yet the same media that reported this that had those same quotes, will turn around in the next breath, scratch its collective head and go, gee, what do they want? What are they about? I, I don't know. Thing is, the corporations that control that media, they know what it's about. They just don't want to admit it. There's one thing, too, that the movement is not about. One thing the movement is not about. It's not about becoming the pet of the Democratic Party and the Obama re-election campaign in the same way that the Tea Party, whose, whose initial anger at the banks and big business overlapped a lot of what Occupy Wall Street is about, they have become the pet of the Republican Party. And that's one thing the Occupy movement absolutely does not want to do. And by the way, no, this does not mean that the Occupy movement wants witless Romney to be president. Don't be a dope. What it means is the rise and fall of any particular party, the benefit of any particular politician is irrelevant. What matters to the movement, what matters to us is results, not who does them. It's the results that count. And we are going to take a break. And we're back and heading into our weekly feature, our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. Um, this week, it involves the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, this outfit, the, the, uh, the Obama administration, like the Bush administration before it, has a program to um, reduce teen pregnancy. And as part of that, the Department of Health and Human Services maintains a list of supposedly evidence-based programs for teenage pregnancy prevention. Well, until just recently, they were all after-school programs, but sometime in April, nobody actually knows when, sometime in April, without any announcement, without any press release about it, the department added an abstinence-only curriculum to this list. Now, the curriculum in question was created by an outfit called the Heritage Keepers Abstinence Education. They're a dim-witted crew whose real-world awareness seems to have stopped with reruns of Father Knows Best. The program contains little or no information about puberty, anatomy, sexually transmitted diseases, or sexual behavior. It doesn't include information about the health benefits of contraception or condoms. It relies on inaccurate fear-based information and fear-mongering classroom exercises. In fact, here's one. In talking about the uh, consequences of premarital sex, this is what you do. Every student has a six-sided die. You roll the die. If you get a one, it means you've contacted, uh, contracted HIV. A two, you've contracted herpes. A three, HPV. A four, you have unwanted pregnancy. A five, you have infertility. And a six, you have gross emotional pain. That's, that's the exercise. The program also promotes heterosexual marriage as the only happy and healthy, safe life path. And it promotes grossly out-of-date gender stereotypes and stereotype gender roles. And in fact, entirely ignores the existence of LGBT people. And what's more, it doesn't work. None of these programs work. None of these abstinence-only programs work. In fact, there's repeated studies showing they don't work. Um, there was one in 2002, a study by a group called Advocates for Youth, which looked at 10 states that had adopted abstinence-only education and compared their teen pregnancy rates before and after they did that, and there was no difference. 2004, there was a study by the staff of Representative Henry Waxman. Uh, this was of youngsters who were taking part in federally funded abstinence-only education. Made no difference. 2005, there was a study of 12,000 adolescents it was published in the, uh, the peer-reviewed Journal of Adolescent Health. No difference. 
2007, there was a congressionally mandated study of all federally approved abstinence-only programs, which found such programs, quote, had little or no impact on sexual abstinence or activity, unquote. And there was a 2008 study published in the journal Pediatrics. It's just, these don't work. Over and over, it's been shown they don't work. Now, the teen pregnancy rate in the United States has been going down dramatically, but there's no connection to these programs. In fact, the states that continue to rely on abstinence-only programs have the highest teen pregnancy rates. And yet here, here we have the Obama administration essentially secretly, secretly endorsing a program that not only doesn't work, but is filled with misinformation, fear-mongering, sexism, and homophobia. Why? I, I, only, I can only come up with one possible reason. This is to head off potential attacks from the right and the children who are sacrificed, whose education and knowledge is sacrificed by being exposed to this kind of crap. That's ah, just too damn bad. In other words, it's an example, another example of the Obama administration engaging in what I have come to call premature capitulation, surrendering even before the fight starts. It is premature capitulation, and premature capitulation is always the outrage of the weak. All right, moving on from there to another outrage. May 2nd was the anniversary of the killing of Osama bin Laden. And, you know, much was made of that, the anniversary of it. And certainly the White House has not been shy about crowing about this. But uh, writer Glenn Greenwald notes that after Osama bin Laden had been killed, there are a lot of folks predicting that maybe the war on terror could be kind of cranked back a bit, could sort of wind down some. Instead, Here's a list that he came up with of what has happened since, this is all since, Osama bin Laden was killed. Congress renewed the Patriot Act without a single reform, and during the debate, Harry Reid said anybody who opposed the Patriot Act was exposing the U.S. to a terrorist attack. A U.S. citizen was assassinated by the CIA on orders from the president without a shred of due process and far from any battlefield. Two weeks later, his 16-year-old son was also killed by the CIA with the approval of the president. The U.S. Attorney General gave a speech claiming the president has the power to target U.S. citizens for death based totally on secret accusations of terrorism without any trial, without any public proof. With large bipartisan majorities, Congress passed, the President signed the National Defense Authorization Act, which included provisions codifying presidential powers of worldwide indefinite detention, and that expanded the definition of what constitutes the war on terror. And construction is now nearly complete on a new headquarters for the NSA, the National Security Administration, to enable them to engage in massive domestic surveillance and even to achieve the so-called total information awareness that was the hallmark of the first Bush term. Barack Obama has authorized the use of so-called signature drone strikes in Yemen. These are strikes where the CIA can target people for death even when the identity of those who could be killed is actually not known. The U.S. has formally expanded its drone attacks in Somalia. In fact, they reopened a base in the Seychelles specifically for that purpose. The FBI has increased its attempts to recruit young Muslims for supposed terrorist plots, lure them in, finance these plots, and then arrest them and charge them with terrorism. And they've also been prosecuting Muslims in the U.S. for crimes that are much more about their speech than about any actions they committed. And finally, NATO airstrikes have continued to kill civilians in Afghanistan. Now, his list is incomplete. The list is not complete. Things could be added to it. For example, it leaves out the continued refusal to prosecute self-admitted war criminals. It leaves out his ignoring, Obama's ignoring of the War Powers Act in Libya and his denying Congress of having any role in uh, any war and peace decisions. It leaves out the continued attacks on whistleblowers. It leaves out the persecution of Bradley Manning. This list could go on and on. This has all been since Osama bin Laden was killed.
But that latest bit, I have to tell you, brings up the latest news from Afghanistan. So Barack Obama, President Hopi Changi, has zipped into Afghanistan, where we have accomplished so much in 12 years that he had to go there in secret and give his speech to the country flanked by two armored vehicles. But don't worry, he told the assembled troops and he told us that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, excuse me, a light at the end of the, uh, a light on the horizon, he said. We will withdraw, he said, but we must do it responsibly, or as we used to call it, we must have peace with honor. But wait, wait withdraw? Are we going to withdraw? Really? It now seems we're going to have some as yet unknown numbers of U.S. troops, uh, military advisors and trainers in Afghanistan for nearly another 12 years until the end of 2024. There's 88,000 U.S. troops there now. It's supposed to be down to 68,000 by the fall, but there's been no announcement of any reductions beyond that. Now, all combat troops are supposed to be out by the end of 2014, but the point is there's no real definition of what constitutes a combat troop as opposed to an advisor. It's totally up to the Pentagon and the White House to determine how many troops that applies to. So frankly, I hope you enjoy a pleasant little war because it looks like we're going to have one for a long time to come. Enjoy your Nobel Peace Prize, Mr. President. All right, that's it for me, except um, one last thing. CISPA, I told you about this before. This is a bill uh, in Congress that would uh, essentially threaten all privacy of all communications on the Internet and allow them to be shared with all government agencies. Um, this bill has passed the House. It's been improved a little bit, but it has still passed the House. It is now headed to the Senate. This bill is still a major, major threat to privacy on the Internet, still a major threat to, well, to our use of the Internet. So you contact your senators. You contact Senator Kerry. You contact Senator Brown. You tell them, vote no. All right, that's it for me. Uh, I got about probably about a minute left, half a minute left, something like that. So I just want to thank you for watching. I thank you for any of the emails that you folks have sent me. Um, I want to remind you, June 16th, we have our open house here from noon to 6. You come on down. You support. This is Community Access Television. This is your channel. Come on down here. Take part. Get involved. We will see you. In the meantime, you have the best week you possibly can, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.